My name is John Newman. I'm the director of the analytical lab here at Physical Electronics. And today I'd like to introduce Phi's newest instrument to you, the Phi Quantes. This is a combined XPS HaxPass scanning microprobe instrument. And it's a laboratory-based system uh, used per for performing both traditional XPS measurements with uh, aluminum K alpha source, as well as being able to do extended depth of analysis experiments with chromium K-alpha x-rays or hard x-rays. And this is generally referred to as a different technique when you're using hard x-rays called HAXPES or hard x-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. The energy of the chromium x-ray is about 5400 electron volts and that provides depths of analysis roughly three times those obtained using uh, traditional aluminum x-rays. And so you can analyze buried layers and interfaces deeper than you can with traditional XPS. And if you're sputtering, you don't have to worry about the chemical state damage that's induced by the ion beam. We didn't start from scratch with this particular instrument. We started with a platform that's tried and true called the Quantera, and, uh, which has a lot of automation to it. And I'll talk more about that at the end of the presentation. So I'd like to show you a short video now of the optics of the Quantes, describing how it works internally a little bit. And you can see here the, we have an electron beam, a lab six electron beam that bombards a dual chromium and aluminum anode generating both aluminum and chromium x-rays. The aluminum x-rays are like any other traditional XPS instrument that Phi makes providing um, multi-point spectral analysis, mapping, depth profiles, that type of thing. We raster the electron beam across the anode surface generating x-rays that in turn scan across the sample surface. So that allows us to obtain x-ray induced secondary electron images that you can, or SXIs as we call them, and you can use those to find areas of interest or um, to avoid areas that are potentially contaminated on the surface. By moving to a different position on the anode, a chromium position, and flipping a shutter, we're now doing HAXPES with chromium x-rays. The input lens for the analyzer is a very open lens design, meaning that we don't have apertures in there to define the area of analysis, because the area of analysis is defined by the X-ray spot that we put down on the sample surface. And that X-ray spot is 7.5 microns for the aluminum source and about 10 microns for the chromium source. So what type of data do we get with the Quantes? Well, here's an example of a 25 nanometer thick SiO2 film on silicon. And with traditional XPS, uh, since the depth of analysis is less than that 25 nanometers, all we see is a silicon oxide peak. Now with the Quantes having the depth of analysis roughly three times that amount, we see not only the silicon oxide present, but we also see a, a substantial amount of silicon metal since we're now uh, looking through the SiO2 into the substrate. If we look at the graph over on the right here, we see that 90% of our signal is coming from the top 7 nanometers with XPS, with aluminum x-rays, but we're looking down 22 nanometers uh, where we're seeing 90% of our signal when we're doing HAXPES experiment. Here's some overlay spectra of HAXPES and XPS data. The XPS data uh, goes out to the 1487 electron volts. Uh, and the HAXPES goes out over 5,000 now with the chromium x-rays. We can see with the HAXPES we have, uh, at least on silver foil, a variety of additional photoelectrons as well as Auger electrons that we can use for chemical state analysis. Another thing that you'll see is that the Auger peaks that were in this region now are moved to a higher binding energy just because we're using a different energy of x-rays. Uh, looking at the chart on the left at the inelastic mean free path versus the electron kinetic energy, we see that for the aluminum source on silicon 2P, we have an inelastic mean free path of 3.3 nanometers. If we switch up to the chromium x-rays now, we're tripling that roughly, going up to about 9.5 nanometers. If you assume a factor of three times your uh, lambda is your depth of analysis, we're looking at about uh, 30 nanometers depth of analysis for, for HAXPES. Of course, that's going to depend on uh, what material you're analyzing and what, um, what photoelectron energy you're also looking at. There's a, a drawback with going to a higher energy photoelectron, chromium in this case, 
in that the cross sections, the photoelectron cross sections, decrease. And we can see here for the silicon 2p transition, um, the signal intensity we get for aluminum and the signal intensity we get using chromium x-rays, it's roughly a factor of two orders of magnitude decrease in sensitivity. However, in many cases, there's now additional transitions that we can follow. Uh, for example, the 1s peak in silicon, and you can see that that has roughly the same uh, photoelectron cross-section uh, using chromium as the 2p does using traditional uh, aluminum x-rays. Uh, some more examples on SiO2 on silicon. On the left, we have a 10 nanometer thick SiO2 uh, film, and using XPS and HAXPS, we see with XPS, we can just barely see the silicon metal peak through the oxide layer, and so we're, our depth of analysis is just a little bit over the 100, uh, 100 angstroms. Uh, in HAXPS now, since the energy of that 2p photoelectron is, uh, is over 5,300 electron volts, they can come from much deeper into the sample, or from the sample, and we see a substantial peak for the silicon metal as well as the silicon oxide. Following a different transition, the silicon 1s, which has an energy in between these two, we see a, a spectrum that's also in between these two spectra. Now we see some silicon metal and a larger SiO2 peak. If we look at the 25 nanometer thick SiO2 uh, film on silicon, with XPS we can only see the oxide because the depth of analysis is less than that 25 nanometers. With HAXPES we see a small silicon metal peak right here, and then with the silicon 1S, we can just barely detect the silicon 1S. So the depth of analysis uh, using the 1S is roughly equal to the depth uh, of that SiO2 layer, or the thickness of the SiO2 layer. So having the ability to change the chrome, uh, I'm sorry, the X-ray energy between aluminum and chromium, and being able to look at different kinetic energy peaks now, since chromium goes out over 5,400 electron volts, we have a wide range of kinetic energies possible for the photoelectrons. And looking at all those different peaks, you get a wide variety of uh, or many pieces of information on chemistry at different depths into your sample. We can do insulators as well as we can uh, conducting materials or semiconducting materials. We have the same type of charge neutralization scheme on the Quantes as we do on our other XPS instruments. It's a dual beam charge neutralization concept where we use a cold cathode electron beam using roughly 1 eV electrons, as well as a very low energy ion beam. And often when you put a sample into the uh, analytical chamber, there's a static charge that's built up on the sample surface, a negative static charge. And if you try to use very low energy electrons to neutralize that area that's being bombarded by the x-rays, the, the static charge on the surface just repels those electrons so they can't get to the area of, in, of interest. Whereas now if you provide some very low energy ions to that surface, it neutralizes that charge, and now your very low energy electrons can get to the area of analysis, neutralizing it very nicely. It's a very turnkey type of um, analysis or a charge neutralization system where you, you set it once and pretty much any insulator that you put in there can be analyzed very easily. Some examples of some insulating samples we see for both XPS and HAXPS. On the left, we have polyethylene terephthalate, a bulk film. Uh, for XPS, we see the three different uh, chemistries present, and the same thing for the HAXPES. We do get slightly wider peaks with the HAXPES, uh, but that's expected because the, the natural line width of the chromium X-ray is wider than it is uh, for the aluminum X-ray. But obviously, it's still sufficient uh, resolution to be able to nicely curve fit this and, and get the chemical states present. Uh, on the right, we see overlaid spectra from silicon and oxygen in an SiO2 sample, and um, you see they, they overlap very nicely, so, showing that it's, it's neutralized well in both conditions. Here's an example of an iron chrome metal alloy, and we have the XPS and the HAXPES surveys going out to 1,000 electron volts, and there's three different things to pick up from this. Um, one is that the, the Auger electrons that are in this region in XPS are now absent in the HAXPES experiment since they're being moved to higher binding energy. And so any peaks in this region, including the iron 2P, is much more cleaner. Um, and, you can, and if there are any other contaminants or, or species in this region, you can detect them very nicely. 
Second is that um, since we're looking deeper with the hax paths now, you see chromium peaks that are showing up that you didn't see before with the XPS because we are looking deeper again. This particular sample had an iron oxide enrichment on the surface and we're seeing through that with the hax paths. Uh, finally, we see that the carbon peak that's quite large in the XPS is, is very much reduced in the HAXPES experiment um, just because now that thin layer of organic contamination on the surface uh, is a much, much smaller percentage of the total volume of analysis. So even though you, you still need to keep your samples clean with HAXPES, uh, it's not as critical as it is with traditional XPS. We can look at the high resolution scans for that iron chrome metal alloy, both the iron 2P and the chromium 2P regions. And with the XPS in red, we see that it's primarily oxide with both the iron and the chromium. Uh, we see those same oxide peaks with the Haspex, Haxpes experiment, but now the metal peaks are more intense than the oxide for both the iron and the chromium. So we're seeing through that, uh, that surface oxide very nicely with the HAXPES. Here's an example of a multi-layer film where it's a yttrium oxide layer on top of chrome on top of titanium. And the TEM cross-section shows that there's also an amorphous yttria oxide layer present there. And it also shows a very bright line, real, real thin bright line on top of the chromium or between the chromium and the amorphous yttria layer. And the, an EELS analysis in the TEM suggests that there's an enrichment of oxygen at that interface. And so we, we use the uh, XPS and HAXPES to try to identify what the, uh, what the chemistry was at that interface. We did three different experiments. We did HAXPES in 90 degrees and 30 degrees. So we did a sort of an angular dependence study here, as well as traditional XPS at 90 degrees. So the real question is here, again, is what is going on at this interface between the yttria oxide and the chromium? And is there oxidized chromium surface, potentially? In the yttria uh, spectra, with both the XPS and the HAXPES, we only see one chemical state present, um, and so it doesn't appear as though that amorphous yttria oxide layer is, is any different chemistry than the crystalline uh, film. In, using XPS, we can't penetrate the, the yttria oxide layer totally. We can't see the chromium or the titanium whatsoever, as you can see in these spectra. Um, in using the HAXPES at 90 degrees, we can see that there, um, it's primarily chromium metal, but there is a shoulder, a high binding energy shoulder, that's indicative of oxidized species of chromium. Um, and similarly with titanium, you see it's primarily metal, but there's a shoulder as well, so there's some oxidation going on there. So to get a little bit better handle on the chromium at that interface, we did the, the angular dependence study and compared the 90 degree data to the to 30 degree takeoff, or more grazing takeoff. And you can see at the 30 degree takeoff angle, there's an enrichment in the chromium plus five, plus six uh, oxidation state. And this 30 degree data is, is a larger percent of it is present at this interface. And so it does tell us that there is an enrichment of oxide at that interface. Uh, here's an example of an annealing study of a hemp device, or a high electron mobility transistor. And the structure of this device is 20 nanometers of aluminum on top of 5 nanometers of tantalum on top of a 23 nanometer film of aluminum gallium nitride. And looking at the survey spectra for the three different anneal conditions, either no anneal or no temperature, and a 400 degrees C and a 600 degrees C, at the no anneal, we don't see any photoelectron peaks for tantalum, so we're not detecting the tantalum per se. However, we do see an inelastically scattered peak here, indicating that those photoelectrons are are, um, are losing energy and we're getting this large peak from that. So there are software programs available to model this and, and help you determine uh, potentially how thick that uh, or how deep that tantalum layer is. When we start annealing now, we do see the photoelectrons from tantalum, so it appears as though the tantalum is diffusing up into that aluminum layer. If we look at the aluminum signal in HAXPES at the three different anneal conditions, we see that there's uh, quite a bit of chemistry going on there with additional oxidation of the aluminum. Um, even at no annealing, we do see both metallic aluminum and oxidized aluminum, 
but as we increase the temperature we see more and more of the aluminum oxide. Uh, most interesting here I think is that when we look at the gallium peak down at this deeper interface um, we see that with the no anneal it's, it's strictly the aluminum gallium nitride or the ALGAN signal but once we start annealing we see that we're reducing the gallium potentially to gallium metal or a gallium alloy and we see the, the structure growing in at the lower binding energy. Now with traditional XPS if you didn't have a HAXPS you could maybe try to uh, sputter off some of the aluminum and, and get to these interfaces. Um, so the next few slides I'd like to uh, describe that type of, of experiment where we used uh, low energy argon sputtering to try to uh, remove surface layers to look at those photoelectrons from the buried layers. And we did that with both HACSPES and with traditional uh, XPS. However, even using very low energy like 500 EV argon ions, Often that ion beam damage depth can be greater than the XPS analysis, depth of analysis. And so trying to analyze these buried layers uh, can often be very, very difficult. Now at HACSPES where your depth of analysis is substantially greater than the ion beam damage depth, um, it's, it's much more practical to sputter uh, off surface layers and, and expose buried interfaces. To uh, exemplify this, we started with a a platinum overcoat on top of TiO2 and um, as many of you know TiO2 reduces very easily under ion bombardment and so it was a good, uh, good substrate for this experiment and the initial thickness of the platinum overcoat was such that we couldn't detect the titanium with either XPS or HAXPES. We then started depth profiling through the platinum using 500 EV argon ions um, and then we analyzed the titanium spectrum at a point where the platinum overlayer in uh, thickness is equal to one and a half times the inelastic mean free path of titanium photoelectrons going through platinum. And we chose the one and a half lambda as a, as a uh, thickness for that layer in that it's, it gives us enough signal so we can still do good chemistry um, at that interface. We, have, we can do some good curve fitting and, and it's not so noisy. The one and a half lambda equals 23 angstroms of platinum for a traditional XPS, where the lambda is 15 angstroms, and it equals 68 angstroms of platinum in the HACSPES experiment, where the inelastic mean free path is 45 angstroms. So we then depth profiled those, uh, that particular sample, analyzed the titanium at those thicknesses, and we compared the uh, t titanium spectrum to that of a TiO2 reference. On the left we see the XPS analysis and we see that there's a substantial amount of reduction going on to the TiO2 uh, when we, even though we still have 23 angstroms of titanium at that surface. Compared to the HACSPES now where the depth of analysis is much greater we see no damage whatsoever. And this totally makes sense if we look at the um, ion simulations uh, for 500 EV argon into platinum. We see on the left here that when we have 23 angstroms of titanium on the surface, the damage region or damage depth goes deeper than that thickness, and so we would expect to see some damage into the TiO2. Compared to the HAXPES now, that damage region doesn't get anywhere close to the interface and so um, we wouldn't expect to see any damaged TiO2. We, we can analyze the titanium with XPS at, um, at thicker regions of platinum. Um, at, if you have a thickness that's twice this and you're looking at three lambda, um, you really don't have enough good signal. The signal is just too noisy to be able to get any good chemical state information. But we did look at it between three lambda and, and the one and a half lambda, and you still see reduction occurring in the TiO2. So I'd now like to go back to the hardware of the instrument, and we, we looked at the video earlier and showed the, talked about the optics, and uh, we can get the X-ray induced secondary electron images very nicely with both X-ray sources and we can align them so we're always looking at the exact same position. The instrument also has a low energy uh, floating argon ion gun and so we can use very low energies for depth profiling. We have CompuCetric Zilar rotation and so we can 
uh, rotate the sample during sputtering to minimize any roughening that occurs, and we have eucentric tilt in here for doing non-destructive angular dependent measurements. It's a very high throughput type of instrument. There's a robotic arm in the system for moving uh, sample platens around. Uh, it has auto Z function to it, so you can automatically set it up to find the proper Z height for the focal point of the analyzer. And we talked about the charge uh, compensation, charge neutralization scheme that's very robust and, and turnkey. If we look at a uh, schematic kind of from the top down of the instrument, you have the sample introduction chamber here. You have a large analytical chamber located here. The, the analysis is done on the stage, and so a, a sample platen can obviously be there. The platens are 75 millimeters in diameter. We also have two parking stages, A and B, that are present in the ultra-high vacuum chamber. And here's the robotic arm that's used to transfer samples within the chamber or uh, in and out of the sample introduction chamber. We also have an option for an auxiliary chamber off to the side of the instrument, and the robotic arm can get those samples in and out of the chamber as well. Here's a picture of the instrument with the doors open, and those of you familiar with the Phi Quantera or the or Quantum from way back, it looks very similar. We have a large bell jar that encompasses all of the optics inside the ultra-high vacuum system. Uh, we have an int sample introduction chamber right here with a high-resolution camera, uh, right above it for taking optical photos of the sample before it goes into the main chamber. The instrument is now turbo pumped as opposed to ion pumped and all the electronics are encapsulated in, on the right, stand, right side of the instrument here. So I hope I've uh, given you a good idea of what the, the Phi Quantes is all about. Uh, it's a lab-based XPS plus HaxPES instrument. Uh, both the X, uh, both X-ray sources, the aluminum and the chromium, have the scanning microprobe technology. It has an open lens design, open analyzer lens design, so it's very good for both large and micro area spectroscopy. We can do angular dependent depth profiling as well as traditional multipoint uh, sputter depth profiling with a low energy argon ion beam. The charge neutralization scheme is turnkey and hands off and it's a very high throughput instrument with robotic sample handling. And with that, I'd like to end. Thank you.